On Din Sul, hill dedicated to the sun, pagan priests and priestesses kept kindled the eternal fire and daily watched eastward for the rising of the god of light and life to greet his coming with peons of thanksgiving and praise. Then, after the sixth century, the new religion had come proclaiming a more mystic light of the world and the Son of God, and to the pious half-pagan monks who succeeded the Druids, the archangel St. Michael appeared in vision on the sacred mount. And there is a footnote. In the Gnosis, St. Michael symbolizes the sun, and thus very appropriately at St. Michael's Mount Cornwall, at Mont St. Michael, Karnak, and also at Mont St. Michael on the coast of Normandy, replaced by the great god of light and life, held in supreme honor among the ancient Celts. And before St. Augustine, Augustine, came to Britain, the Celts of Cornwall had already combined in their own mystical way the spiritual message of primitive Christianity with the pure nature worship of their ancestors. And their land was with them, or their land was then, as it most likely had been in pagan days, a center of pilgrimages for their Celtic clansmen, clansmen from Ireland, from Wales, from England, and from Brittany, when in later times new theological doctrines were superimposed on this mysticism of Celtic Christianity, the sacred fires were buried in ashes, and the light and beauty of the pagan world obscured with sackcloth. But there, in that most southern and western corner of the Isle of Britain, the sacred fires themselves still burn on the divine hilltops, although smothered in the hearts of its children. The Cornish men's vision is no longer clear. The Cornish men's vision is no longer clear. He looks upon Cromlech and Dolmen, upon ancient caves of initiation, and upon the graves of his prehistoric ancestors, and vaguely feels, but does not know why his land is so holy, is so permeated by an indefi indefinable magic, for he has lost his ancestral mystic touch with the unseen. He is educated and civilized. The hand of the conqueror has fallen more heavily upon the people of Cornwall than upon any other Celtic people, and now for a time, let us hope happily only for this dark period of transition they sleep until arthur comes to break the spell and set them free in Brittany, as was pointed out at the beginning of this chapter ireland and Brittany are to be regarded as the two poles of the modern celtic world but it is believed by celtic mystics that they are much more than this that they are two of its psychic centers with tara and karnak as two respective points of focus from which the celtic influence of each country radiates and there's a footnote in this connection, we may think of the north and south magnetic poles of the Earth as centers of definite yet invisible forces which can be detected and to some extent measured scientifically. With such a psychical point of view, it makes no difference at all whether one scholar argues Karnak to be Celtic and another pre-Celtic, for if pre-Celtic, as it most likely is, it has certainly been bequeathed to the people who were and are Celtic, and its influence has been an unbroken thing from times altogether beyond the horizon of history. According to this theory, and in following it, we are merely trying to put on record unique material transmitted to us by the most learned of contemporary Celtic mystics and seers, there seem to be certain favored places on the earth where its magnetic and even more subtle forces are more powerful and most easily felt by persons susceptible to such things. And Karnak appears to be one of the greatest of such places in Europe, and for this reason it has been thought, as probably selected by its ancient priest builders as the great center for religious practices, for the celebration of pagan mysteries, for tribal assemblies, for astronomical observations, and very likely for establishing schools in which to educate neophytes for the priesthood. Tara with this tributary Boyne Valley, is a similar place in Ireland, so selected and so used, as in our study of the Celt of the cult of fairies and the cult of the dead, manuscript evidence will later indicate. And thus, to such psychical and magnetic, or according to perhaps others, religious or traditional influences as focus themselves at Tara and Karnak, though in other parts of the two countries as well, may be due in a great, even in an essential manner, the vigorous and ever-living fairy faith of Ireland, and the innate and ever-conscious belief of the Breton people in the legend of the dead and in a world invisible. For fairies and souls of the dead, though strictly speaking not confused, are believed to be beings of the subjective world existing today, and influencing mortals as they have always existed, and influence them according to ancient and modern traditions. 
and as they appear now in the eyes even of science through the work of a few pioneer scientists in psychical research. And it seems probable that subjective beings of this kind, granting their existence, were made use of by the ancient Druids and even by Patrick when the old and new religions met to do battle on the hill of Tara. The control of Tara as a psychical center meant the physical, psychical control of all of Ireland. Today, on the hill of Tara, the statue of St. Patrick dwarfs the Leath stone beside it. At Karnak, the Christian cross overshadows dolmens and meniers. A learned priest of the Roman Church told me, when I met him in Galway, that his opinion of those places in Ireland where ancient sacrifices were performed to pagan or druid gods are still, unless they have been regularly exercised under the control of demons, or daemons, meaning spirits. And what the druids were at, Car at Terra, and throughout Erin, and most probably at Karnak as well, the priests were in Egypt, and the Pythonesses in Greece. That is to say, Druids, Egyptian priests, and priestesses in charge of Greek oracles are said to have foretold the future, interpreted omens, worked all miracles and wonders of magic by the aids of daemons, who were regarded as an order of invisible beings, intermediary between gods and men, and sometimes including the shades from Hades. I should say, as before, if he who knowing Ireland, the land of fairy, would know in the same manner Brittany, the land of the dead, let him silently and alone walk many times in the sun and wind and storm in thick mist through the long broad avenues of stone of the alignments at Karnak. Let him watch from among them the course of the sun from east to west. Let him stand on St. Michael's Mount on the day of the winter solstice or on the day of the summer solstice. Let him enter the silence of its ancient underground chamber, so dark and mysterious. Let him sit for hours amid cromlechs and dolmens and beside miniers and at holy wells. I told you I can't pronounce anything. Let him marvel at the mightiest of miniers, now broken and prostrate, at Loch Maria Quare. And then let him ponder on the subterranean places near it. Let him try to read the symbolic interpretations of the rocks and Gavrinus. Let him stand on the Ile de Seine at sunrise and at sunset. Let him penetrate the solitudes of the forest of Rosilandi. See, I can't. And walk through the Val Sans Retour, the Vale Without Return. And then let him wander in footpaths with the Breton peasant through fields where good dames sit on the sunny side of a brush or a wall, a bush or a wall, knitting stockings where there are long hedges of furs, golden yellow with bloom, even in January, and listen to stories about Corrigans and about the dead who mingle here with the living. Let him enter the peasant's cottage when there is fog over the land and the sea winds are blowing across the shifting sand dunes and hear what he can tell them. Let him, even as he enjoys the picturesque customs and dress of the Breton folk and looks on at their joyous rond, perhaps the relic of a long-forgotten sun dance, observe the depth of their nature, their almost ever-present sense of the seriousness of human life and effort, their beautiful characters as their mystic land has shaped them without the artificiality of books and schools, their dreaminess as they look out across the ocean, their often perfect physique and fine profiles and rosy cheeks, and yet with all their brooding innate melancholy. Let him know that there is with them always an overshadowing consciousness of an invisible world, not in some distant realm of space, but here and now, blending itself with this world, its inhabitants, their dead ancestors and friends, mingling with them daily and awaiting the hour when the Anku, a king of the dead, shall call each to join their invisible company.